Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Monday morning, April 8th, 2024. Hope everybody's doing all right today. And as I'm sure everybody knows, it is the day of the eclipse. Everybody's excited about it. Well, I don't know if everybody's excited about it, but anyway, a lot of people are talking about it. We here in Mammoth Spring are in the in the path of the total eclipse, so it should be pretty interesting. Hope your day's going well. We're in Isaiah chapter 36. We're back to Isaiah. Did a, I guess you would say a special video, a requested video last week. Back to Isaiah this week. And we're going to, my goal is to hit two chapters today. Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. As always, if you have any questions or comments while we're going through, Feel free to use the comment section, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. We're recording the audio. That will be uploaded to our Podbean channel, so if you don't want to watch a video, you can listen to the audio, and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel as well. All right, Isaiah chapters 36 to 39 are a historical section. Help us date the book, the events that are taking place, and we're going to talk about a little bit of archaeology today, too. I'm actually, I started teaching last week here at Mammoth Spring, our young adults class on Sunday morning, a class on the Bible and archaeology, and I have personally never taught that. I've mentioned it throughout the years and things like this and mentioned various discoveries, but never really had a focused class on the Bible and archaeology, and it's very beneficial, very beneficial study. So we'll, we'll notice something about that today in terms of King Sennacherib, king of Assyria, but we'll get started here in the text. Now, we're told here that this is in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Isaiah chapter 36 and verse 1, that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And so as you're looking through your text, now you'll notice here on my Bible app, if you're looking at, if you're able to see it well on your screen, you can read the parallels here in 2 Kings 18, and 2 Chronicles 32. Now, really, it's like 2 Kings 18 through 20. 2 Kings, uh, or rather 2 Chronicles. I'm not sure of the chapters of 2 Chronicles, but you scroll to Isaiah chapter 37. Well, Isaiah 37 is 2 Kings chapter 19. And so this, this app will break down your parallels for you as we go through it. But anyway, there are, there are three accounts of what we're getting ready to read here recorded in Scripture. And obviously... It's during the days of the prophecy, the prophetic work of Isaiah. We're looking at approximately 700 B.C. or so. And again, chapters 36 and 37 here really help us set a historical context, the, the goings-on, if you will, in the nation of Judah. And, well, let's just get started here. He comes up against all the fortified cities of Judah. The king of Assyria sent, and you'll notice here the text says, the Rabshake. Now, Rabshake, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. That's how I pronounce it. I could be way off, but whatever. That's the idea of a military officer, perhaps something along the lines of uh, uh, like a chief administrator, uh, commander-in-chief, something like that, the language we might use today. So the king of Assyria sends this guy, okay, this representative of his government, with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. Now, that's a mouthful there. This is, uh, the first place we read about this is back in Isaiah chapter 7. The first place in Isaiah that we read about it. Uh, this is a city, uh, this is a region outside the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the Fuller's Field, uh, a launderer. This is a place where laundry was done, particularly the whitening of clothes. Uh, you had a place where you could wash. You had a... In fact, you can actually see, you can do a Google search for images, and you can actually see the, the area that's outside the city of Jerusalem. I believe it's, if I remember correctly, it's on the west side, outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And you'll see, because it's it's so close to the city that you've got the Rabshake, okay, the representatives from Assyria, speaking to representatives from Hezekiah, and the Israelites who are there inside the city can hear what's going on. So, but anyway, that will come out in the text. But they're, they're meeting in this particular, particular place, the same place where Isaiah and Ahaz met, uh, again, back in Isaiah chapter 7. I don't think I've said, 
Good morning to anybody. Gail, Janie, Lyle, Connie, Vinoda, Susan, Sheila. Good to see all of you guys. I just kind of got started and forgot to say anything. Glad y'all are here. All right, so we have this official meeting. Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, verse 3, who was over the household. Shebna, the scribe. So this is Hezekiah's representation at this meeting. Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the, Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. So what you then have beginning in verse 4 is this, rep this military representative from Assyria having a speech, essentially, telling them, telling the Jews what they're getting, what Assyria is getting ready to do to the city. Now, as we've said throughout the study of the prophet Isaiah, Assyria is the dominant world empire. This is, these four chapters, 36 through 39, actually, not only do they set the um, historical context for Hezekiah and for Judah, what's going on there, but but more most certainly, with Assyria, because it's at this point in time, right around this time, historically we know that Assyria falls to the Babylonians. And archaeology fills in some blanks for us in the Bible, and the Bible fills in some blanks for, uh, let's call it secular history. So you put the two together, they complement one another, and we can see a lot of the, the, uh, the historicity of these events here. Hey, good morning, Anna. Good to see you. All right, so this meeting between Assyrian representatives and Jewish representatives, and beginning in verse 4, Isaiah 36 and verse 4, the, we'll just call him the, uh, oh, let's call him the chief military officer here, the Rabshakeh. That's, again, Rabshakeh is not his name. It's a title. He begins telling these representatives from Hezekiah what's going to happen. Now, we're not going to read all of this, but we'll just, we'll just hit on some high points. Uh, verse 4, thus says the king, uh, the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? I say, you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now, in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now, if you want to read about the rebellion, you can actually do that in Scripture, going back to 2 Kings chapter 18. One of the things that I've pointed out throughout the study of Isaiah, and I mentioned it throughout the study of the Minor Prophets, is you have, you have this kind of thing going on here. So this Assyrian representative says, as it's recorded in verse 6, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt. There's more than one occasion where God's people get in political trouble, they're being invaded, and instead of turning to God in faith, they turn to some some other country, some other source that they think they will find strength and support. Well, in this case, it would be Egypt, which, which is south and west of the Promised Land, as we call it. Well, Assyria says that's not going to do you any good. It's like leaning over on a, like a walking stick that's broken. It's going to stick in your hand. It's going to be trouble. So is Pharaoh the king of Egypt to all who trust in him. He's not going to help you any. And that's interesting because, you know, having the Bible and knowing how this all plays out, Judah's deliverance didn't come from Egypt, even though that's where the, uh, the Assyrians say that's what you're trying to trust on. Anyway, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now, this is an interesting, this, this illustrates the ignorance of the, of the Assyrian representation here and the ignorance of, of idolatry and particularly like ter, uh, territorial gods. I'll talk about that more here in just a minute because there are some things that come out in the text here, but um, he says this. We're going we're gonna to look at a passage here in just a minute connected with this. So Hezekiah has torn down all these high places. He's taken away your gods. And so here's what you need to do to be protected from Assyria. Give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses. All right, I'm going to give you a fighting chance. And then he kind of mocks them, if you can even have enough men to put on the horses. So uh, this guy's what we would call today. He's doing quite a bit of trash talking and defying the God of Israel. Let's see here. I'm going to go to 2 Kings chapter 18, and 
this is uh like I say gives us a little more a little more detail. Second Kings eighteen, and I've got the verse written down here around verse twenty. I'll start around verse nineteen. Yeah, here we go. So this is the king's record of it. Second Kings eighteen, verse nineteen. Then the Rapshki said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, whose uh, what confidence is this in which you trust? Okay, you speak on having plans of war, that they're just words. You know, basically, who do you are that you think you can rebel against me? You're trusting in Egypt. Well, that's not going to work out for you. You say you trust in God, but Hezekiah has taken away all those idols. He's taken down all of these altars. And, and this is interesting because Isaiah and the kings record this. He's broken down all the high places and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Well, that's precisely what Hezekiah did. He was one of the good kings of Judah, one of the reformers. Uh, you can read Second Chronicles chapters, basically Second Chronicles 29 through 31, and you can read about his reforms, his restoration of the temple, his celebration of the Passover. He's, Hezekiah is trying to get, back, get things back in line. And you have these foreign idol worshipers, these Assyrians. They know what's going on, all right, in the land. They've heard of Hezekiah's work. And, but, but they don't understand whose altar it is in Jerusalem that Hezekiah is re restoring. They just think it's another god. All right, so here's what you need to do. You need to give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria. All right, so the Bible does record that as well, and I thought I had that written down here this, about this pledge. But anyway, um, yeah, it's Second Kings chapter 18. It's actually a little bit earlier in the chapter. Let me scroll up here to verse 13. Uh, yeah, here it is right here, Second Kings 18, 13. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Uh, then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. He said, all right, I want 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold. Well, how did Hezekiah meet that request? Well... Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord, from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid, and gave it to the king of Assyria. So again, this is, I would say this is one of those efforts that instead of initially placing his trust in God, I'll just, I'll just pay this guy off. That's going to be the best way to handle this. Well, that's not going to work. Let me get back here to Isaiah chapter 36 on the screen. I think we're around verse 8. So anyway, yeah, verse 8. Now, therefore, I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria. Well, 2 Kings 18 records that pledge. So that's what I say, uh, what I was saying. You, you read Isaiah 36 to 39, 2 Kings 18, 19, and 20, 2 Chronicles 29 to 31, and they're all very similar because they're parallel accounts, but you get a bit of different information from each one. So back to Isaiah chapter 36, this, this guy's speech continues on down, oh, down through verse 10, basically. And uh, he's going to come up here and destroy it, Judah, Jerusalem. And that's his plan. All right, so he finishes his speech in verse 10, verse 11. All right, these are the representatives from Hezekiah. Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in the Hebrew, uh, speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. Like I said, this Fuller's Field where they're having this meeting is right outside of the city of Jerusalem. And if you were obviously standing on the wall, you could hear what was going on. And so it's, this is one of those, I don't know exactly how to describe it here in verse 11, but it's, uh, I don't know if cowardly is the right word because they're there, they are having this meeting, but it does appear to me to be a bit cowardly. Hey, listen, talk to us in this specific language, because we don't want you to do it. We don't want you as our enemy. You're here to defeat us and take our city. We don't want everybody else to know that. All right, keep it down a little bit. Uh, so basically, <laughs> look at this response. Verse uh, Isaiah 36 and verse 12. Has my master sent me to your master? 
has Sennacherib sent me to Hezekiah to speak these words just to you and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat their who will eat and drink their own waste with you you, you know it's like you think we're here for a friendly visit and that just you get to hear these words so the Rabshaki, the the commander in chief of Assyria he really opens up now maybe gets a little louder Verse 13, speaks in a loud voice in the Hebrew language. He does exactly what the messengers from Hezekiah asked him not to do. And he says that basically to them, basically he says the same thing to whoever can hear him on the wall now, not just the official representatives from Hezekiah, tells them the exact same thing that he's told these representatives. They've already captured 46 cities, 46 of these fortified cities in the region of Judah. Jerusalem's next in line. Okay, they're going to surround Jerusalem. They, that's what they are there for. Hey, Shirley, good to see you. And Sammy, good to see you. Glad you're on the stream. All right, so, like I say, now, beginning here in verse 13, he begins addressing the common people, you might say. Don't let Hezekiah, verse 18, persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. And this is where, so I mentioned a little bit ago, the territorial gods, national gods, things like this. That was a common thinking in, in paganism that like each nation had their own god or gods. And not only territorial like that, but even specific locations. Gods of the mountains, gods of the skies, gods of the rivers. And that's obviously, that's obviously what Assyria believes about Judah, about Jehovah. And, well, has any of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of the Sepharvaim? Indeed, they have delivered, uh, indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Well, from a paganistic, idol-worshipping perspective, Assyria has overtaken all these gods, and the God of Israel's next, the God of Judah, more specifically, Jehovah. In fact, notice this here in Isaiah 36, 20. Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? And if you notice in your biblical text here, L-O-R-D is all caps. And when you see that, that is the, that is the what we refer to as the personal revealed name of God. You think that Jehovah should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. So now he's intimidated not just the representatives directly from Hezekiah, now he's talking to the people on the wall who can hear him. So what do they do? They held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. That's probably the best best thing to do. I mean, what are you going to say back to all of this? So the, the officials that Hezekiah sent, they returned to him with their clothes torn, and they relay the words of Rabshaki to Hezekiah. And that takes us into Isaiah chapter 37. The people are totally demoralized, Judah that is, totally intimidated by what's going on here. So chapter 37 is the reaction of Hezekiah, and not just the reaction of Hezekiah, but also of Isaiah. So we'll just start reading here again. We're not going to read this whole chapter, but we'll just lay it out a little bit. So it was when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself in sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Well, that's the right re response. The initial response is to do, well, go get Isaiah. Let's talk to the prophet. What, is, what can the prophet say? They said to him, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come forth to birth, have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It's like a woman... It's time to deliver, and she just can't. Well, the day of trouble's here. Assyria is right outside the door. What are we going to do? All right, so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Here's what we do. Or here's what, what do we need to do? Say to your master, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor. And return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. A couple of things there. Number one, he's going to hear a rumor. And 
as I read the text here, chapter 37, I think the rumor is actually right here in the next couple of verses. Assyria is on, okay, they're on the charge. They're on the march. Like I said, they've already uh, conquered 46 fortified cities of Jerusalem. I'm sorry, of Judah. The scripture, the Bible tells us that, but history also tells us that. So I want to, I want to do something here real quick. Uh, I got a new book the other day. I'm teaching through this subject called the Bible and Archaeology on Sunday mornings. I got this book called Unearthing the Bible: 101 Archaeological Discoveries That Bring the Bible to Life. It's a very interesting read. A lot of good information. On page 130, uh, 138. And let me go ahead and do this because I've got a picture of what I'm about to talk about. And so, what what I've been telling my class on Sunday morning in terms of what is the purpose of archaeology? Well, archaeology is just a science. It's the process of excavating sites, looking for remains, looking for evidences of ancient cultures and their their practices, their religions, and their writings, and all of this kind of stuff. Bible archaeology is no different. And one of the things I've told my class is that those archaeologists that are digging up sites in the Holy Land, as we call it, they're not, archaeology in itself is not necessarily concerned with the existence of God. It's not necessarily concerned with proving the Bible to be true, proving that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. That is not the purpose of archaeology as a science. Now, does archaeology verify what the inspired scriptures say? Well, of course, and man, Hundreds and hundreds of time, it's, times it's done that. So we need to understand that archaeology in itself is just a science that has for, let's just say, approximately 200 years, early to mid-19th century, when it really came to life in the, in the Holy Lands, has repeatedly verified what Scripture says. So let me go ahead and put this image up here, and I want to read something to you. What you're going to see here is called the, uh, the Sennacherib Prism. This was discovered in, I believe it was 1835, if I'm, if I'm thinking correctly. It's called the Annals of Sennacherib. Uh, and I want to read something to you. Uh, it's called, a, it's, a, it's a baked clay prism. Uh, it's been preserved and recorded. It's, hex, it's a hexagon shaped. It's 38 centimeters tall, 14 centimeters across. And uh, it's, it has six sides. It's covered in 500 lines of, a, of Assyrian cuneiform. And cuneiform is a, a wedged-shaped style of writing. Best way I know to put it. These texts probably all originated in Nineveh, although the only reliable record of discovery location is from the Taylor Prism, and that's what you're looking at on the screen right now. That's called the Taylor Prism, named after the man who found it. It was found in the armory at Nineveh in 1835. So I'm going to read to you a portion of what was on this Sennacherib prism that matches precisely what Scripture says. All right? Quote, As for Hezekiah the Judean, who did not submit to my yoke, I surrounded and conquered 45, uh, 46 of his strong-walled towns, as well as the small towns in their area, which were without number, by leveling with battering rams and bringing up siege engines, and by attacking and storming on foot by mines, tunnels, and breaches. I besieged and took them. 200,150 people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle, and sheep without number, I brought away from them and counted as spoil. He himself I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. Fear of my lordly splendor overwhelmed that Hezekiah. The warriors and select troops he had brought in to strengthen his royal city, Jerusalem, did not fight. Hezekiah there felt the fear of the power of my arms, and he sent out to me the chiefs of the elders of Jerusalem with thirty talents of gold and eight hundred talents of silver and all kinds of valuable treasures. So, again, that's just a small portion of the Sennacherib prism, also known as the Taylor prism, that you're looking at on your screen. And if you notice there on the right-hand side of that picture, if you're looking at it, it says what this thing affirms is Isaiah 36 and 37, 2 Kings 18, 17, and 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 9. So let me pull that down. I just thought that might be interesting for you to see what that actually looked like. And like I said, I'm, I'm reading what that thing says from this book called 
unearthing the Bible. The interesting thing is, Sennacherib's prism, so he even acknowledges, yes, my book is by Titus Kennedy. Connie, excellent book. Um, so it records the taking of 46 fortified cities, smaller towns, over 200,000 captives, but it never records the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, I've got him shut up in there like a bird in a cage, but it never records its destruction. So let's get back here to Isaiah chapter 37, because Isaiah's message to Hezekiah is now, don't be afraid of his words. He's going to hear a rumor, and he's going to die in his own land. So Assyria is on the march. They're not just, they're not just after Judah. They're, they're spreading out all over the place. He's got wars going on multiple fronts. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 8. Then the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish. So the king of Assyria sent these people to Judah. While they were in Judah, another front of his war breaks out. So you have this split. And the king heard concerning Tirhaka, king of, Ethi of Ethiopia. He has come to make war with you. So when he heard it, when the king of Assyria heard that Ethiopia is attacking him, he sends messengers to Hezekiah. Um, we've got this going on down here with Ethiopia which is at the southern end of the, of the Red Sea, all right, southern end of the Sinai Peninsula, if you want to look at a biblical map. While he's got that war breaking out, he wants to remind Hezekiah and the Israelites, the Jews, listen, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't, don't let your God tell you that. Don't think this is not going to happen. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria... So, it's basically a reiteration of what we just read in, in chapter 36. Okay, the gods of all these nations didn't deliver them. So, don't begin to think that the God of, of the Jews is going to deliver them. So, here's what Hezekiah does, verse 14. He received the, hand, the letter from the hand of the messengers, read it, and he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord, and Hezekiah prayed. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, the cherubim, this is talking about the mercy seat. This is the place where, this is in the most holy place of the temple, the place where God would meet the priest on the day of atonement, all of that information. You are God, you alone, and all the kingdoms of the earth you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear and hear, open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Well, this is a, this is a prayer out of great distress. God knows exactly what's going on. He knows the the reproach of the living God that has come from the king of Assyria through his messengers. So here's what here's here's his prayer. Uh, you go down to verse chapter 37 and verse 20. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. All right. Now you get down to verse 21 here. And now you have Isaiah coming into the picture. Isaiah's message to Hezekiah from God based on this prayer is the virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. This is God's response to Sennacherib's boasting that the Assyrians are going to take over. The virgin daughter of Zion, that's Jerusalem. And She's a virgin in this text because she's not yet been assaulted by the Assyrians. They're, they've surrounded her, but the assault has not yet happened, and in fact, it's not going to happen. And that's what's so interesting, again, I'll just pop it back up here real quick, about this Sennacherib prism, is that it never records the, uh, the capture and the, 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 the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, whom have you reproached and blasphemed? This, again, this is God responding to Sennacherib through Isaiah. Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel. I'm actually working on a lesson about that phrase. It's used repeatedly throughout Isaiah, and it is not insignificant. Who the Holy One of Israel is, what that means. So this goes on down, uh, this response to, Hezekiah, uh, to 
Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is interesting. 37, Isaiah 37, 28. But I know your dwelling place. This is Jehovah to Sennacherib. You're going out and you're coming in and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, I will put a hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way that you came. Well, see, that's what Assyria had planned on doing to Judah. It's not going to happen. Uh, let's see, keep on going down. Well, I tell you what, I kind of slow down here. Um, Jerusalem is besieged. All right? they're, again, they're surrounded by Assyria. So here's a sign that's given. All right, you're going to eat this year such as grows of itself, and in the second year, what springs from the same, and the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards, eat the fruit, and the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. They're not going to be destroyed like Sennacherib has been boasting they will be. All right? For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. So here's the ultimate message from Isaiah to Hezekiah about Sennacherib, king of Assyria. He will not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my sake uh, and for my servant David's sake. And that's significant too with all the prophetic implications of what God said to David about his descendants. So, the last part of Isaiah chapter 37 is the record of the Assyrians being destroyed by an angel of the Lord. Now, like I said, the Sennacherib prism, Taylor's prism, essentially stops with Jerusalem being shut up and Hezekiah like a bird in his cage. And as you look at this, I want to just look at a couple of other passages. Isaiah 36, 37 to, I'm sorry, Isaiah 37, 36 to 38 records not only the death of 185,000 Assyrians by the hand of the Lord's angel, but Sennacherib went home and he was worshiping in the house of his God and his sons killed him with the sword and someone else took his throne. That's the end of it. So I'm going to go over here real quick to 2 Kings chapter let me find it here, 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 35 records the same thing for us. came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose in the morning, there were, there were the corpses all dead. All right, so 2 Kings 19, 35 to 37. I'm also going to show you this one. I'm going to run over 2 Chronicles chapter 32. And it begins in about verse, I believe, verse 20 here. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Second Chronicles 32, beginning in verse 20. Now, because of this, because of Hezekiah's prayer and going to Isaiah, and because of all the messages that they have received from Sennacherib and what they did in response. They cried out to the God of heaven. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader, and captain in the camp of the, uh, of the king of Assyria. So he, he, the king of Assyria, returned shamefaced to his own land. And that's what, that's what Isaiah said. By the way he came is the way he's going to return. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with a sword there. And that you know, it's it's specified there for us in Isaiah chapter 37. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. So I'm going to stop there for today because Isaiah chapter... Let me get back over here real quick. Isaiah chapter 38 follows, obviously, follows just what happened. So... Assyria is done for. All right, they're, they're out of the way. Well, in those days, Hezekiah was sick, and they actually receive, a, they receive representatives from Babylon. Assyria is followed by the Babylonians. 
Babylon becomes the next dominant world empire. And so I don't want to start chapter 38 today because, well, because I don't want to. We'll start chapter 38 tomorrow. All right, guys, that's what I've got for today. Um, very interesting chapters to me, Isaiah chapters 36 and 37, for multiple reasons. Obviously, for the events that take place and the, the display of God's power, His sovereignty, but then also the archaeological evidence that, again, is archaeology's purpose is not to prove the Bible to be true, but ar archaeology has repeatedly proved the Bible to be true. Precisely. So, just some interesting stuff in there. All right, guys. Appreciate you all being here today. Hope you have a good rest of your day. I'm going to go home. We're going to watch the eclipse. And so, if you're doing that, enjoy it. Hope you have a good rest of your day and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.